κρατήσω το βήμα για πολύ. Ε, ήθελα να περάσω το βήμα στον Μάριο Σρόμ, καθηγητή ψυχιατρικής, ε, ιδρυτή του Διεθνούς Δικτύου, του Intervoice, ε, ο οποίος θα μας μιλήσει για την, το παρελθόν, το παρόν και το μέλλον του Διεθνούς Δικτύου. Ε, να πω ότι ε, σκεφτόμουν πριν από λίγο ότι είναι η, η δεύτερη φορά που θα μιλήσει ο Μάριος Ρώμ εδώ. Ε, έχουν μιλήσει μαζί με τη Σάντρα Έσερα ακριβώς από αυτό το βήμα, σε αυτή την αίθουσα, το 2011. Μάριος. Good evening. It's great to be here. It's great to see so many people attending this conference because it's always quite risky to organize these things. And it's oh, very good to be back into uh, Thessaloniki, which is a beautiful town that we never suspected that Greek would make it to this conference. So I like to have a... I like to have a memory, huh? Okay. Good. You never know in the world how small country gets a big initiative done and working. And I agree. And I was, uh, I like to thank for that Argenia Georgiaka. I can't really pronounce these names very well, but that was our share of uh, tonight. And then Virginia, who lives also here in the city, has started to, has also um, been part of the organization. And Dimitris, Olga, Irini. I think these organizers have been had a lot of stress, so I think it's good to name them. Then from Athens, Lichurkos, which second name I can't pronounce, is too difficult, Lichurkos but he translated the book Living with Voices in the same time with Stefanos and Marianne, his friend, and Marina from Athens also have helped a lot in organizing this conference. I will tonight have the, uh, like the ability to, to call many people because we are, Sandra and me, are the grandparents. We were the parents. We grew to the grandparents and we now growing to the great-grandparents because there are very many generations by now. And we still overview that history. But Paul Baker, one of the first generation who just uh, was picturing around, is sitting in front and uh, supported Hywell also and stimulated him. Also one of the older generation, Hywell, I think. And Derek was one of the first generation too, because he's as learning psychiatry, being an assistant in training, started with us the interview of comparing people who hear voices becoming patients and those who don't become patients. And that was a very critical moment for our interest. Is there a difference between people hearing voices and become a patient uh, or not? and there is with the people who never become patients. And I will speak about that tomorrow, but there is no differences, also not biological, also not in the brain scan. It all began with only one patient voice here, and she, Patsy Hage, expressed her critics to me, because I was her psychiatrist. And it took her a year to convince me that she really heard voices. That was the situation in 1985. Then she was also one of the few who expressed their critic because that is very important for voice here and now you know more about it than then we didn't know anything. So have been, stay on being critical because <clears throat> she did not have any profit of my help. I only was able to make a diagnosis and, <clears throat> and she wanted help to, because she was overpowered by her voices and that's a reality which many voices start with. And to change your relationship was 
the, mo the situation uh, Betsy Haga asked for, but we had nothing to offer at that time. Only the nice thing is that it's still the person, pr the purpose to promote the change in relationship between the voicier and the voices. It's not getting rid of them. And you have heard quite a lot of voiciers tonight, and they don't get rid of them. There's no sense of rhythm. It's a part of your ability. You are more open to your subconscious, could you say. You are more sensitive to things. And you have experienced things that need inspiration to overcome the traumatic experiences. It's not only therapy. It's inspiration. And that's why it's such an important movement. We are not starting therapy. We're not trying to find out a new church. We don't want a church. It's very nice what, Paul, uh, what Peter, is, Peter is doing when there are a few people who want to cooperate. But first of all, we are our own. We on our own our voice here who know, uh, learn to know how to cope and change our relationship, how to be resilient to get the critics out to the world because a lot of voices when they start are not very much resilient. You heard this evening most resilient voices, but the mass of them still have to grow and emancipate. That's still the purpose, to promote the change in relationship with hearing voices. And that purpose is for the level of the person because you have to work from person to person in voice hearing support. But that's also the change into the relationship of the professional. You have to be critical to the professional because they don't know anything about it. So you can't be aggressive to them. They just don't know anything. And that was what the first patient, Patsy Hagen, learned me quite good that I never was teached to know anything about the living experience of hearing voices. Furthermore, I'm afraid that the, not afraid, but I'm sure that there will be a political level we need to change. And then we also will have to influence the scientific level, and I will call a number of PhD now on their way tonight. But all, all these levels, we will make together the difference. It's not any professional of what level, it's not any voice here on what level. What we have to do is to develop together. Sandra, Escher and me were the grandparents, as I said, and we had the first generation. I will now call upon a little, uh, call the names of those who are the third, uh, no, Ron Coleman is still, I think, to the first generation and has made the biggest effort of spreading the approach around the world because he influenced Australia and you have heard how Australia has grown by Kelly uh, Coleman and we have heard by Lisa Forstel, no, sorry, all your names getting a little bit through each other, but Lisa Forstel it's uh, talked about the USA. She is the, the last, the third generation, I think, and Kelly Coleman's also the third generation. But they have learned and are both started with Ron Coleman's uh, um, active activities, I think. So after Ron, we had the the, our uh, first, uh, second generation uh, with Peter Bullimore with Jackie Dillon, Peter Bullimore you have heard, he also started the uh, Paranoia Society and groups. Then we had Rufus May, he is not for a change on the floor tonight, he mostly is, but he will be tomorrow, because he is inventing all kinds, promoting all kinds of creative influences to change one's relationship with hearing voices. And he happily don't call it therapies, I would say mostly not, because therapies is already going into a non-emancipatory uh, direction. 
Therefore, I think we can be happy that Greek have to change because of the Europe community will force them to change. This will be very difficult and it has been done with Italian in Italy in 1978 with the law of this uh, political involved psychiatrist and we heard from one of the Marcello Maca, Macario also he told about Italian and Marcello Macario made a real network in Italian but also he was uh, one of no he's from the second generation well yeah I have to get these people through it they all come later he said already he's only a few years busy to get it really from the ground uh, the older generation was uh, Pino Pini and he called him because with Donatella Micinesi they too started the movement and translated some books of ours. And then we see this generation, also the second of Olga Runtiman, who is very good in English because she seems to be born in England, but I'm not very sure about that. No. But anyhow, she speaks English, but the nice thing nowadays, she's politically involved and try to change that, but she also will promote the Spanish people, speaking people, and started to go a few times this year to Spain because she speaks Sp Spanish. And it was a pity that her neighbor, Paul Baker, didn't speak Spanish in all these years. But we make a joke sometimes, he was very, in, uh, very important for England but he didn't get Spain over the, over the border. Okay, then we have Judy Mantel here, also of the second generation, who uh, tries to develop her small island of uh, Jersey. And we have very important professionals, Trevor Isles, who made great progress in Aarhus in Denmark and took now 15 people from Denmark to uh, this conference which you organize because Denmark is really combating with England <coughs> about who is better. <laughs> no, that is, but let them go, it's very nice because they stay to the idea that you have to be free in interpreting what you do as long as you are an alien for voice years. And he has developed quite a good system. Like then also Ger Frederiksen in Norway, who is also here, and he is also full-time uh, busy with voice-hearing problems. Uh, Trevor also organizing, Ger uh, treating or uh, coping with people, with, uh, working with people who hear voices in Norway. In Norway, it is hardly possible to get a network. These people live too far from each other. Norway has four million in, uh, inhabitants on a territory as big as Japan, Japan. So that's why it's not so easy to do more than little uh, places where people can work. Then we have heard Joachim uh, Schnackenberg, who originally is German, is now training in, uh, people in Germany and also in services in Germany to because Germany is also quite conservative. But as a German who speaks fluently English, he seems to find a way on to overcome the very obsessive way Germans go around with psychiatry. Because they are too much involved with, uh, with the diagnosis. Then we get to the third generation, that is Kelly Comans. You have served from uh, Australia. And Robin Timmers, who talked about Holland, and Tineke Naven, who you didn't hear but is also here, they are all from the second generation, the third generation, like also Lee's Forstel. So you see, in the third generation, we have already quite a number of well-speaking voice hearers, and it's from them it has to come. We only are aliens. You can't emancipate another person. When the voices don't emancipate themselves, they won't come anywhere. I think that you have seen in all emancipation movement, 
like the blacks, the women, the homosexual uh, streams. It is very, very important to be an alien, but focus on the powers of the voice ears. Then we have Jean Derobert, also a third generation, started in France and already has six cities in France where they have, or four, I'm not very sure, four cities where they have started uh, hearing voices groups and they have the support of Birgit Sursi who translated in Canada the, our books into French because French was a language we couldn't reach, we can't write it and uh, so it was difficult to find a person who wanted to translate but in Canada there was a spontaneous the translator of the first accepting voices, which is most worthwhile for voiceers themselves. So we have also, of that third generation, Will Hall. You haven't heard speaking him, but you will in this conference, I support. Uh, it is amazing how well you, we third generation voiceers know how to promote their own in interests. Because that is the big change. When we had the first conferences of voiceers and uh, professionals, the voiceers weren't as resilient as you have heard them now today. I think that's a real growth of uh, development. And that's also why it is so important to have people who also make PhDs in this field, like Eleanor Longdon, who is, I think, the uh, this moment very near her PhD, she couldn't therefore not be here. Then we have from Greek, Vaso Feneku, who also is uh, guided by you, so I hope you get her through this problem. But it is still always a problem to have a PhD, and Angela Wood also have a voice here with her today who are preparing a, who is preparing a PhD. Then we have some professionals, young people like um, Joachim Schnackenberg and Jonathan Gatsby, who also are here and are working on their PhD. Also that have grown in during the time that we see a lot of number of more PhD in preparation about hearing voices from the press perspective of listening to the voices and listening to their emotions. So I was asked also where we are heading for, and I think that can be quite short because we are heading for emancipation of voice hearers because hearing voices has a life on itself. It has nothing to do with any category of illnesses, and I will give you the scientific proofs tomorrow. What it will also has to do, liberty or lawful to change of professional IDs because, and also political IDs, because as one side we see that the politics make laws to uh, force people into medication, we know that these people are handicapped in their development, so I am afraid that this process will not be possible only without juridical procedures. And there are now about six juridical procedures on its way to get things changed, because it's like smoking. These medications are dangerous for the development of voice ears. So we don't have to discuss that anymore. We just have to stimulate the change. Thank you.